welcome to On The Ledge podcast, the podcast that keeps your plants perky. And I do hope that your plants are in the pink E this week. I am doing fine, albeit a little bit melted at the edges from the ongoing heatwave here in the UK, which I know a lot of you in other parts of the world are also experiencing. Whew! get those fans on high except of course here in the podcast studio where for your audio benefit I have to work without a fan yes that's what I will do for you listeners sit here in the sweltering heat recording a podcast because that's how much I love you when you put the search term carnivorous plant into google the first question that comes up in the opening page is the following can a carnivorous plant eat a human Now, it's amazing how many people think this might be the case, but when you look at the Nepenthes family of carnivorous plants, you know, you can kind of see where people are getting the idea from, crazy though it may sound. There are more than 100 species of Nepenthes or tropical pitcher plants, and they tend to be native to Southeast Asia, with some in Madagascar and Australia as well. And the biggest one, which is called Attenborough's pitcher plant, Nepenthes attenborii, is absolutely enormous. It's a metre and a half tall uh, with huge pictures that are about 30 centimetres across and a bell shape. They just collect rainwater and they're huge. And although there's been a lot of myth and legend about these plants, they have been proved to capture and digest rodents and other small animals. And before you start looking for somewhere to buy an Attenborough's Nepenthes, I have to tell you that this is an incredibly rare and endangered plant. They are on the red list of endangered species and in their native location around the summit of Mount Victoria in the Philippines, they are increasingly at risk from poachers, which is really, really sad. The great news is that thanks to modern propagation methods and hybridisation and all kinds of incredible plant fun that's been happening in the carnivorous plant world, there are many, many Nepenthes which you can get access to, grow, buy and generally have fun with. And today's guest is somebody who's been helping people in the US do exactly that. Dominic Gravine of Redleaf Exotics is a colourful character. He's the perfect complement to the drama of the Nepenthes family. And he absolutely loves these plants. I called him up for a chat earlier this year. He's since moved his operation to Tennessee, where he's got an incredible new polytunnel full of wonderful Nepenthes. This interview illustrates the danger of browsing someone's Instagram account as you talk to them, because I just couldn't resist asking him about some of the images from his page. And I'm not specifically talking about his world naked gardening day picture but well yeah you have a look and you'll see what I mean just click through from my show notes for that link he describes himself as an Nepenthes whisperer at Redleaf Exotics garden fairy creator and inspirer I'm distracted Dominic because I'm just looking at your Instagram feed I mean I look at a lot of Instagram feeds of a lot of plant people and what's nice about your Instagram feed is it's not just a load of plant pictures wonderful though plant pictures are but I get the sense not having met you in person before that you're quite a live wire there's pictures of you on here um wearing a rather natty golden crown which yeah (laughs) um there's some great pictures of Nepenthes uh, but there's also you're not obviously not afraid to to be a little bit silly which is great what is it about the picture plant that makes them your number one species well i've always loved you know artwork really bizarre things unusual things um and then as i got into plants around 10 um i was looking for something that was different and that no other growers had but i just found my way to nepenthes and they're just bizarre it's so crazy that they're not a flower but actually a modified leaf and the fact that they're large, colorful, they're super complex, like the details in them. And I just think it's so amazing that um, plants have evolved to produce something that looks like that. And they last a really long time, way longer than flowers. So there's just a bunch of things that attracted me to them. And I mean, they can eat insects, small rodents. So that's just, it's, but they're endlessly fascinating to me. I can see why you're attracted to them. And they're having such a moment now that you must be feeling like 
The bell of the ball, now that nepenthes are really taking off as a plant that uh, are becoming very common and, and grown by lots more people, that must feel good to you. Yes. Um, when I started, I was around, like I said, around 10, 13 years old, somewhere down there. And I've been doing this for close to 20 years now. And the hobby's really grown since I started. And I would still consider it quite small, but um, it's definitely getting more popular and almost like a cool plant to grow. Um, I've been in business with my nursery for a year now, and I certainly got a large number of people hooked and started growing them. And some of their collections are made completely in my plants. So it's definitely like growing um, at a quick rate. That's brilliant. And these days, there are so many cool hybrids out there, so many interesting plants um, among this uh, particular group that are just so stunning. What are your absolute favorites? Oh, and I do love hybrids so much. Species are amazing and you can't like replace or put a, I don't know, a, I'm trying to say on the species, but the hybrids are so spectacular. My favorite plants are it's called Nepenthes loei crossed with truncata. And it's a hybrid between two, two of my favorite species. And it just gets pictures uh, that are, I would say, larger than most Nepenthes. It's one of the largest Nepenthes I've ever seen, this particular clone. And it gets so big that it, it can eat mice. Almost on every picture, it attracts and eats mice. That's my favorite hybrid. My favorite species is Nepenthes vicii. And that is my logo. It gets a very spherical round body on it with this really big peristome it's called or the lip the stripes part um and it's just this big flared it almost reminds me of candy like a candy cane or something with all the shapes on it very dreamy they're just very tactile aren't they i just i whenever yeah. i see the penthes i just want to go and cradle one of those pictures and kind of <laughs> yeah it's just it's very there's something very tactile about them and I, maybe that's part of the plant's evolution that it's kind of trying to draw you in uh, and i guess it, it works brilliantly what how are they attracting whether it be mice or bugs how are they what are their tactics to actually get these creatures uh inside them is it visual is it scent is it nectar? What are they doing? They have a whole ton of skills up their sleeves. Um, <laughs> they're scent number one, and um, I'm sure uh, the insects can pick it up way better than we can smell it. Like when I'm in the greenhouse, they have this scent, um, but that attracts insects from a far away. But then as you get close, uh, the colors, the pattern, some of them, I believe, like the red tones kind of resemble rotting flesh in a, in a way. Um, and then on top of that, the biggest one of them all is that they produce a really sweet sugar out of glands, usually under the lid that covers the pitcher. But um, a lot of the insects really come for that sugar and they can produce it in a really uh, in large amounts. And the mice, too. That's why um, the larger ones, I think, eat mice because they produce so much. It's like. I feel like every animal loves sugar. <laughs> I mean, we love sugar. So <laughs> if there's a large amount of it, I'm sure the mice pick up on that and that's what they come for. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a really interesting point. Yeah, they it's like they know what's going on in the outside world, but not. I do believe plants have minds of their own. They can definitely sense um, in ways I don't even think we know yet. I think that's true. I think that we've got so much more to learn, haven't we, about all these plant species? So much to learn. It's endless. <laughs> and do you find somebody gets into these Nepenthes and then just goes absolutely nutso buying loads of plants off you and just turns their place into a jungle? What, have you got any real sort of super fan clients who've gone mad for these plants? Oh, yes. <laughs> I have people that uh, customers and friends that were once orchid growers. And we've, I believe many of us know how orchid growers are. They just have to have them all and they have tons and then there's no space and then they have to get greenhouses. It's the same thing with this. Um, some of my uh, customers that are orchid growers, I see their collection of orchids getting smaller, but the Nepenthes are becoming more. And then I have people that um, grow, you know, regular house plants and they got one plant off me and they did it well. And some of them are filling up their windowsills. Others are building greenhouses and their whole collection is made of plants they got just from me. So yeah, it, it really is like an addiction. You, you get hooked to them, especially if you can grow them well and find out what they love. 
Do Nepenthes have interesting flowers as well as these incredible pictures? I would say compared to the pictures, the flowers aren't really the show. Um, they're very primary, uh, just five petals, the middle with the pollen. They're very basic looking, but they do smell interesting. Um, they look beautiful because they're like a big, uh, kind of like a big spike, but they're not very colorful and they're nice, but the pictures are the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Why do you need it at Fancy Flowers? Because really, you've just got those pictures doing their amazing work. Um, some people will actually, depending on what your goals are with the plants, they'll cut the flower spikes off to save the plant energy. Because sometimes when they're in flower, the next few leaves won't picture to put all their energy into the flower spikes. Right. And do you find that um, when you're, that there's a, a one particular Nepenthes that's an excellent entry level plant for anyone who hasn't grown them before? Is there, is there any particular hybrid or species that you'd recommend starting with? Yes. The two common girls are Nepenthes Miranda, um, which is a hybrid, and Nepenthes ventrata. They're very common amongst the commercial market. Sometimes you could find them at your local garden center. Um, they're both very uh, rewarding and easy plants. Um, and then as far as species, Nepenthes ventricosa, um, that you can usually find around too, and Nepenthes sanguini. Um, I have a lot of people that have uh, really good success with them as their first Nepenthes. Yeah, oh, that's good to know. And what are the basics? Nepenthes 101. I, I buy my first Nepenthes. What do I need to do to keep this thing alive? Is it like most carnivorous plants that it, in that it needs rainwater rather than tap water? I believe it depends on, you know, where you live and how harsh your water is. But I've grown Nepenthes in different homes uh, throughout the years at using just tap water, and it's fine. But when you water them with RO or distilled water, you really do see a nice difference. They're just more perky. They just seem, they just seem more robust and happy. Um, I definitely notice the difference when I use it, but um, they've grown fine with tap water. Um, and as far as the basics, when I think of Nepenthes, I just think of really high humidity for them to be their best. They can be adapted to the 50% range, but to be their best, really high humidity humidity, preferably 70%, um, and really bright light. They Not full sun, but just bright, glowing, luminous light. They love that. They get, they just, they're so happy in those lighting conditions. Um, if you're growing them inside, the basic uh, setup that I used to use was a T5 grow light. A lot of people are getting into the LED lights now, but you just string one of them up, put the plant a foot or more below them. You don't want too much heat on the plant. And if you keep them in a little shallow saucer of water, they seem to be really well, uh, do really well. The humidity seems to be the trickiest part for most people. But, you know, a mister bottle, there's the humidifiers we use for when we have a cold or something. Just anything you could do to get the humidity up. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? And I guess there's also the option of having them in a bathroom or somewhere where the, where it's a more humid environment. I think I'm the thing that I need to invest in before I go down the Nepenthes Avenue is humidity monitor. I think one of these things would be so useful. I have no idea how humid it is in my house from room to room. And I think I need to buy one of these, invest in one and to actually find out what's going on uh, and which rooms might be suitable. Because Right now, I'm only guessing. I've, got, I've really got no idea because as humans, unless the air is super dry or super moist, we just don't really notice, do we, in the same way that plants do? At all, no. And it's even um, regular house plants, they're just so different when the humidity is really high. They just they have a glow to them. <laughs> they love humidity. So tell me about your day. You have uh, your business, Red Leaf Exotics. How does your day work out? Do you spend as much time as possible with your plants, hanging out, touring around customers? How does it work? So my typical day revolves around waking up. My greenhouse is literally right outside my bedroom door, like 10 feet into the yard. So I usually wake up and go out there and water them all. Um, I don't have an automated uh, watering system. I like to just go out. I have a hose hooked up to my RO unit. And I just go and I water them all. And then I'll go up on the ladder and give each one of a lot of hanging pots. They love to hang um, and I'll water them. But my day early, I'm, I'm in the greenhouse like all day doing stuff for the plants. The only time I really leave is to go buy food, go to the gym, 
or maybe go see a movie, but I meet literally in the, the greenhouse all the time. Um, usually the beginning of the week, always on Monday. Um, any orders I get, I'm always shipping them on Monday. And then as the week goes on, I'll get more orders, but I always on Mondays, I wait to ship. So pretty much well, in the plant all day, every day, as much as I can. And you're you're a young man, if I can put it that way. <laughs> that sounds that sounds really patronising. <laughs> you're a youngish man. Um, how, what do your friends uh, think of of your uh, Nepenthes obsession? Is everyone kind of getting on board with it now, or people are still like Dominic and his plants? No, it's always been Dominic and his plants. Um, no, my friends love it. Um, you know, it's just something. It's so weird. They're they're great conversation pieces. A lot of my friends are artists, so um, my friends here, even they're my roommates. Uh, we go in the greenhouse, and it's just so fun to look at them and stare at the colors. It's whether you like plants or into them or not. They're just really fascinating. I can't picture not being fascinated by them. So yeah, they love it. I can imagine an artist could get a lot out of uh, a, a Nepenthes. There, there's so much going on there in terms of just colour and pattern and symbolism and all kinds of things. Yeah, living here in New York City, uh, just meeting, you know, makeup artists, stylists, photographers, painters. I, I have a slew of friends that will come and look at them and get like inspiration and ideas from them. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, that's very inspiring. I don't own any nepenthes but as usual as usually happens with this podcast when i do something on a particular plant that i don't have it immediately makes me want to go out and buy them and that's that's happening i'm noticing in the here in the uk nepenthes seem to be much more widely available even your kind of bog standard garden center will have one or two hanging up in the summertime so we're really getting into this i think here in the uk um uh, it's really exciting once you you know get your first experiment on it see how it loves it get it used to the humidity once you get the first one growing the rest are kind of a walk in the park it's like all plants that you just got to find out what they love and they need Never heard of the term RO water before? That means reverse osmosis, which is a filtration system which you can use to create water that's suitable for carnivorous plants and other plants that don't like mineral salts in their water. I'll put some links in the show notes to give you more information on that. But thank you to Dominic for our chat. He's a great guy, and I would definitely recommend checking out his website, Redleaf Exotics. And while I remember, just to let you know that On The Ledge podcast is taking a break for a fortnight. That's two weeks off for me to recharge my batteries. The 10th and the 17th of August, I'll be back on Friday, August the 23rd with a new show. If you're wondering what to do when the show's off air, well, I would strongly recommend that you pop on over to Facebook and join houseplant fans of On The Ledge. And I can say without any possible bias or influence that this is the friendliest Facebook Facebook houseplant group there is there's no there's no mean there's no really making mean comments everyone's incredibly supportive and wonderful and I intend to keep it that way so if you too are a lovely kind and helpful houseplant person get on over to houseplant fans of on the ledge and join in with the chat we'd love to see you there it would also be incredibly helpful for any of you who are enjoying the show but haven't left a review on your podcatcher of choice, be it Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast or whatever. Please do go and leave a review for On The Ledge. It makes a huge difference to other people being able to find the show. And it really gives, brings a smile to my face as well, which is always very welcome. So please do drop your thoughts on On The Ledge via the medium of the review extra points for a catchy title and now it's time for question of the week 
And I wanted to talk about a question that's come in from Brenda and Stephanie, who both wanted to know recommendations for places to visit in London to see cool house plants during a visit to that great capital city. Now, there are many places in London to see great house plants, and I'm just going to bring you a few of my favourites. If others of you have more suggestions, then please do get in touch and I can add those onto the show notes. There are a few must-sees, of course. Kew Gardens has incredible glass houses filled with plants that you might recognise as house plants, but probably a lot bigger than your potted plants. Chelsea Physic Garden also has some beautiful glass houses. And I also love the conservatory at the Barbican, which I believe is only open on a Sunday. I'll put details of that in my show notes. Again, it's like a tropical wonderland in there, in among the brutalist architecture. And it's rather little known. So the Barbican is another great one if you can make it on the limited opening hours. I haven't been, but the Sky Garden is known as London's highest public garden. This is at 20 Fenchurch Street in London and it's got incredible views of the City of London and the gardens are supposed to be very lovely too. You have to book but the tickets are free so it's definitely worth looking on their website which is skygarden.london if you want to book a visit to the Sky Garden and there's also a place where you can eat if you fancy trying something a little bit in the way of fancy cuisine. If you get the chance to visit Prick London on Kingsland Road in London, subject of episode number 24, when I interviewed owner Janelle Leon about her incredible cactus business, that is definitely worth a look. Although you may be tortured by the fact that you can't bring any plants home if you happen to be an overseas visitor. And if you're looking for London gardens with special openings, it's worth having a look at the National Garden Scheme website, ngs.org.uk. Just put in a postcode or a location and you'll be able to find all the garden openings that are happening in that area at that time, which is really useful if you want to have a good poke around somebody's glass house or agave collection or whatever. If you're interested in community garden, the King's Cross Skip Garden is a brilliant place to visit. This is right in the centre of the building site that is King's Cross as this area is massively redeveloped. It's a wonderful place with a cafe and lots of interesting installations, including, well, gardens made out of skips. And you're just down the road from the Camley Street Nat Natural Park, which is a lovely little park, an oasis right in the centre of busy London. So those are both definitely worth checking out. I'll put full details in my show notes. And as I said, if anyone's got any more recommendations, do tweet me at Jane Perone, drop me an email to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com or put a note on the Facebook page, which is On The Ledge Pod. week's show it just remains for me to say thank you so much to my new patrons Catherine, eric madeline fiona and darcy by donating five dollars or more a month they've all unlocked bonus interviews and content and they're able to find out what's coming up before anyone else and help me keep the show going going up this week on patreon in the next few days is an interview with suzanne masters who's an ethnobotanist with a specialism in orchids she'll be answering some phalaenopsis questions in our upcoming phalaenopsis special but she also told me about her research into edible orchids and it's really fascinating stuff so by signing up for patreon you can unlock that interview and many more and i will see you on the other side all you gorgeous plant people May your stromance sparkle and your pileas pop. Bye! The music you heard in this week's episode was Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops, Rasham Pidity Pakara by Samuel Corwin and Overthrown by Josh Wadwood, all licensed under Creative Commons 
see my website for details. 